Hey, this is Jason of Archaics.com. Here's a unique little video. Now, I want to I want to remind my listeners, man, this is a simulation theory forum. Now, Archaics, the Archaics research, my 124, 125 videos, however many I got now, the central premise is that we live in a controlled environment. It is a simulated environment. I call it the holosphere for many reasons. Now, my take on this is a little bit different because I arrived to my conclusions a long time ago from researching antiquities and ancient mysteries and putting this data together, I had come to several conclusions that didn't even make sense at the time. But you have to understand, I was trying to make sense of a phenomena for which I had no frames of reference at the time. And what I mean by that is I was sitting in a Texas prison cell putting together a massive amount of data and coming to conclusions that I had not come into contact with. Those conclusions were already being postulated by the scientific community as ancestor simulations. The phenomenon where it is believed by some, by some theoretical physicists and just deep thinkers in the scientific community that sometime in the future, we, it got to the point where one of two things happened. Either the world became so terrible and uninhabitable uninhabitable that our consciences were jacked into a an oasis type uh, simulation where multiple simulations could be run and these are called ancestor simulations or it wasn't in the future it was sometime in the distant past that we had developed the technology to go ahead and do away with the actual I, the actual uh, ca causes of death itself but in order to make life interesting and fascinating to to gain experience we had to create a situation where we would forget who we are and we would import our consciousness into a vast array of simulations that we call life and while we're living we believe these are reincarnations when they're not we're actually going from program to program to program now what you're seeing here is what I do in my off time now I used to believe that I had the ability to just go, just gung ho, go hard, and uh, and just data mine, read, research, collate the information, organize, edit, post. You can't. Your batteries are going to run low. As a matter of fact, you, you'll start having a, a a nervous breakdown from trying to do all that. And and I know I never got to that point. Uh, I'm pretty good at, at self assessment, and I realized that I got to. I have to have some downtime. I have to have some leisure time, in order to operate at full capacity. So what you're looking at here is the only video game that I play. It's called Massive Warfare. And I am in an alliance called Tank Hill with a bunch of other vets. Now, I'm not a veteran. I'm not a veteran at all. But everybody in my group is US military, a veteran or a biker. And that's where I fit in. So I'm sorry, I'm not no stolen valor here. I'm not trying to claim to be a vet. But uh, now many vets are bikers, but not all bikers are vets. So when it comes to frames of reference, here is why, here is the, here is why so many people, man, have a hard, hard, just, they can't wrap their mind around that we are existing within a simulation. And it's because of what, are, what is referred to as frames of reference. Now, the world we look, the world we see, man, we only see 5.5% of the electromagnetic spectrum. You hear in your audible range, far, far less than what's actually out there. Our five senses restrict us from perceiving the world truly as it is. And this is necessarily so because we need to receive these bits and bytes and pieces of information uh, uh, in increments in order for us to our mind and our central nervous system to sequentially put these into frames of reference for us uh, second by second. And we don't know how many times the simula this simulation uh, uh, pulses or has a wave front or, or reboots seven times a second, 700 times a second. It's very difficult to tell. However, the fact that we are now creating simulated battlefields, simulated cities, already shows you that we are approaching the level of technology by which we are existing within. Now, when I say that, we're only scratching the surface today in our uh, RPG gaming systems and uh, even even uh, uh, like uh, military simulations for fighter jets and uh, submarine warfare. Much, much of the learning 
is done in these fields on simulators, flight simulators. So, but the level of technology required to do what's being done now is fantastic. However, now we're starting to see that it's achievable. What is unachievable right now to us is a sufficient power source that would allow for all this to happen. Where 7 billion individual conscience, consciences can perceive all these little limited local areas. It's like there are 7 billion little uh, non-local pockets occurring where something is perceiving which is an individual personality, and yet they're all in the same simulation or series of simulations. Now, I'm not going to go into, in, into detail. We're going to do that in some coming videos on simulation theory. What I mainly wanted to show you here was that this is, uh, no doubt, quite possible in our future, if our future was going to remain uninterrupted, which it is not, which is the subject of my Phoenix research, the resets, the research, resets are viable because I've, I've, as I've shown, we are watched and we are observed and our keepers, the custodians are not going to allow us to achieve even a modicum of the technology uh, that would allow us to not only perform this as well, but to escape it. This is Jason with Archaics.com. Just some food for thought. Video games are primitive simulations. Archaics is an acronym. It means Advanced Research on Chronological History of Artificial Intelligence Eggs. I'm often asked about artificial intelligence eggs. Many people send me messages and I find questions on, on the YouTube comments. So I'm going to answer this as best I can. But our frames of reference are entirely governed by our experiences in the past. And our experiences are in the past are entirely governed by the frames of references of our predecessors and the information that they passed down to us that we absorb as facts. Now, artificial intelligence X can take on many forms to many people. Whatever your concept of reality and God is, Artificial Intelligence X will assume that identity for you. It will pass off as fact the simulated holography that you believe to be true. I'm going to relate some things in this video that are kind of disturbing, but they're also liberating as well. If you take them into consideration, then you identify with what and who you really are. I'm asked, how do we escape this prison realm, this holography, this, this simulation? And I don't believe for a second that, it, that we're supposed to escape. This dungeon realm of the Demiurge is meant to be passed through. Our life isn't what you think it is. It's a beautiful thing and it's also horrifying. Artificial Intelligence X is inescapable. We live within it. I've presented other videos where I explain where no AI system will ever be developed by us inside this sentient biogram because we are living in an AI system. It's an impassable threshold. We're not going to do it. It's all marketing bullshit. But that's, another, that's for another video. Artificial Intelligence X is God in whatever form you choose Him he or she or it to be. There's no escape from it because you require sleep. And as long as you need to go to sleep, you will always be perpetually jacked right back into the very system that creates this holography. I'm going to explain it as best I can. Archaics. Advanced research and chronological history of Artificial Intelligence X is the only way we can know that we are in a simulation. The study of history has many mysteries, but they begin to take on a quantifiable form. They begin to make sense. That's why I'm releasing these videos when I'm releasing them. The next reset is over 19 years away. We have some time, but these resets are a part of the system. The system protects itself.
Archaics research serves to bring about an awareness that we humans are immortal beings confined within an advanced biogram medium of sentient holography that we call Artificial Intelligence X. We have attached our own ideas and concepts to this AIX holography, a vast simulation that is aware of us, provides for our existence, and returns to us precisely what we hold to be true. Through the agency of imagination, we are able to alter this holography, but we cannot escape it without our present avatar, our current physical aspect, without dying. While living as the avatar we find ourselves to be, right now we cannot escape this holography because the nexus between our true self, our spiritual personality, and our avatar, the physical body that we reside in, inside this simulation, is the central nervous system. Our central nervous system is the controlling, binding, our personality, the true us, a spirit to the artificial intelligence X simulated holography. The most natural activity of the human animal experience is sleep. And the sleep awake cycle, cycle is actually a quantum loop. The quantum wave phenomenon, when not directly observed, stays in a non-local waveform of absolute potential. But when focus is directed at the wave function, there is a collapse in the physicality. This makes the sleep-awake cycle a part of the quantum computing of Artificial Intelligence X. The control mechanism is the central nervous system. In sleep, the conscious mind goes into non-locality mode, jacked directly into the AIX. The unconscious in sleep is reviewing all possible event trajectories your life can take the next period of being awake, based off of past decisions, present activity, and belief systems. We awaken when the data transfer is over or when it's interrupted. The quantum collapse occurs and the five senses begin absorbing data all over again. We are alive again. The feeling of disorientation when awakening is because just a moment before, we were somewhere else. An immortal spirit outside the simulated context. AIX keeps us under control because it is in control of us when we're not conscious. Even animals are jacked into the system. Just like my dog right here. My little puppy. I don't know if AIX is truly an enemy. Although I suspect the world that we live in is a simulated holography of predator versus prey. A a world that is disguised to make us believe that it is real when it is not. But we have so much evidence that the world we live in is a simulation that it would take years to provide the video evidence. Basically to uncover everything that we have found. We can only release it in pieces. Um, if I had a multi-million dollar budget, that would be different. I would hire about 10 or 12 people. And within a 30-day period of time, yes, we would pretty much educate the world with some fantastic videos instead of these homemade videos that I do. But I'm doing the best I can with, with what I have. And basically what I have is simply information. And it's free. That's why I don't charge anything. I try to give my books away free as well. AIX is both a curse and a boon. The maturity of the human spirit dwelling through the simulation, we grow through experiences. Pain is a teacher in whatever form it takes. So I can't say that it's entirely evil, although I wouldn't want to really affix any duality to it. It seems to be a reflective medium that gives us what we, what we project back into it. But... AIX is inescapable. There is no technology that could ever be fomented from within a subjective bubble that could objectively control, escape, modify, or do anything to AIX's control systems. It's not possible. We are 
living in a simulated holography that is absolutely fantastic. The technology is far beyond anything we're doing in our own VR reality gaming systems. Many of you think I'm absolutely crazy for conveying through several of my videos that the stars lie. That when you go out at night and you look at the heavens and you look at those stars, you're looking at a multi-tiered hologram, several layers of holography that are designed to deceive you and your telescopes and your number theories that that is absolutely real, a real image of the cosmos. But the math doesn't lie. There is absolutely no way that space in a Newtonian universe that is filled with cosmic dust and particles and photons going in all different directions and radons and waveforms and particle forms and cosmic gravel, whole gravel fields. This is what physicists are saying. There are strewn fields that are just traveling in all different directions and different orbits. And yet, we see stars billions of miles away. And yet... The stars that we see that are billions of miles away probably don't exist anymore. But the photons made it, such a small particle, made it over such vast distances without a single speck of space dust blocking that photon. It's ridiculous. So, we live in a very clever medium. Just a simple mathematical study of the moon and its relationship to earth begs us to understand that man this isn't real you're living in a simulation the planetary movements a mathematical study of the history of the world shows that events happened in precise fibonacci spirals it's too perfect the system the holography is based on five 1.618 everything obeys this and it does so in protocols of pi, 3.1416, and perfect moving curvature, which is 5.08. And it does this in palindromes going forward and backward sequentially, like a drop of water hitting the surface of a pool. And the ripples travel forward and backward, just like the ripples of time. But you're jacked into a system every single time you go asleep that convinces you that all of this is happening in a linear fashion when it's not. We don't just live in one simulation. We live in multitudes of simulations. And every time we wake up and go to sleep, the system has corrected many of the mistakes of the day before. And this is how you explain coincidence and Mandela effect and synchronicity and deja vu and hell. You can even crop patterns and gremlins, it's all in simulation theory. There is no escape from the holography. Our central nervous system is perfect. It is the unification of the spirit and matter. We're jacked into it every day. Can't help it, you gotta go to sleep. I'm going to sleep right now. I'm about to get jacked into the system. There's nothing I can do about it. Because awareness of the prison that I'm in does not change the bars, they're still there. Even those of you who are not familiar with the biblical narrative have heard the story of the Tower of Babel, a most unusual story. And by no means is it only within the confines of the book of Genesis. Although no other books in the Bible really go into any depth in the, into that story. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, it's not mentioned again at all, which is highly curious. The story of the Tower of Babel is unique in many ways because it's evidence of simulation theory. Many of my listeners have followed my simulation theory evidence through, through, through my videos, and a lot of it, yes, is hit or miss. It takes a certain modicum of imagination to basically step outside the paradigm that you live in to view history through, through a, a sieve of coding, which is exactly what I believe it to be. Yes, it is my position that as a historian who provides date-specific events, having written my Chronicon and so many other published works that further those dates, I'm, uh, I am more convinced of a simulated holography that has manipulated the past into a series, a series of definite dates that we can find by many different species of arithmetic. But it's coding.
Just like DNA is coding, and the story of the Tower of Babel is no different. In fact, it's very unusual. That gods, in the plural, would look down upon the earth and see that a civilization of humans had become so technologically advanced in their manufacturing ability and their capabilities and in their imaginative capacity that it would threaten the custodians, our keepers, the architects of the simulacrum. And they looked down and they saw that mankind was building a project. It was a city that was built that was required for one one thing. It said, let us make for us a city and build for us a shim. This is the original Hebrew in Genesis. Build for us a shim. Now listen, I am a Zechariah Sitchin critic. Do not get me started on the definition and all the translations on the word shim. I am just not going to listen to it. You have many different Sitchinites, man, that will promote that theory. I am not one of them. Because the most archaic root for shim never meant rocket ship. That is a modern day interpretation. In fact, it's such a ridiculous interpretation that rocket technology is, is going to be phased out, if we even make it that far. Rockets are not the most technologically advanced vehicles that we have created. The Department of Defense can enlighten you in the Patents Department on, on that subject. Now, when it comes to the Babel incident, we have the human race at peace, no war, speaking the same language the same religions, the same religious beliefs, the same iconography, the same imagery used in texts over and over again. They came together with one single purpose and one mind. And it took for them to build a city to get this project done. Because while they were in that city, they had a place to live. Food, they had an infrastructure intact that would allow for all the components of a civilization to come together to build a very special construction project. Because that, those people, that race of people, was the human race. And there was no division at the time. And they came together with a single purpose to build a monument. In the mythological version, it was to build a monument so high that they can invade heaven and challenge the gods. Who they realized were their overseers. But that's not the true story. It's a cover story. The human race realized that they lived in, inside a simulated containment field, like a Dyson shell. And they realized that there is a way that they can open up a gate and a portal to escape back into the real universe and not the simulated universe. Not this biospheric containment field that allows for the creation of species and subspecies and the manipulation of DNA to create new life forms. This is why, in our simulated history, we have these explosions of life forms in the tens of thousands that seemingly appear out of nowhere, with no, with no period of development, no evolution that can be seen. There's no evidence of, nat of natural selection and evolution and, and these theories that we, that we promulgate today. Instead, they are explosions of life. The exact same thing happened with the languages that are found on this planet. They, they did not develop. develop. Written languages did develop. They had to. But spoken verbal speech exploded. 1899 B.C., in the month of November, something terrible happened. A shim was being built. And the most archaic Hebrew root for shim from the Semitic is a monument. And in many old books, shims were pyramids. They built this monument and the gods were offended. Not only were they offended, but they were afraid. And the Genesis text does reveal that. It says, Behold, the man has become as one of us. And there is nothing impossible for him that he cannot do. This became a problem. But it was so easy because... The simulation, the holography coding was already intact. The protocols had been running for thousands of years. It's not difficult to introduce interference patterns into older coding. You don't change the older coding. You modify it in subtle ways. And this is what happened. Languages were created overnight. 
This is the Babel simulation, and it's only one simulation that we are experiencing today. We are still within the confines of that simulated context, and it has a definitive end. We are also existing in a Phoenix simulation. And I have many published books, articles, posts. I'm not going to get into that. Many, many of you are tired of hearing about the Phoenix. I understand. That simulation ends in May 2040. There is also an Anunnaki simulation. And I know a lot of people are, are becoming critics of an Anunnaki chronology. But I'm going to show it in a future video as irrefutable. There is no way you can look at this evidence. I have more information on this on this Anunnaki chronology than I do the Phoenix research. But that simulation too will end in November 2046. The Babel simulation ends in the year 2070. But even that is not the final collapse of the simulated holography. The simulacrum itself is already trying to defend itself, creating thousands of new theories, filling social media up with all kinds of things just to distract people from the truth. There are a few Facebook groups and websites, WordPress blogs, that are putting out very accurate information, but they are very few. Enjoy this video. It's a short presentation. This is about the Babel simulation. Many ancient records documented what happened, but there's no way it could be real. It could have never happened in our context, in our reality, had not we been living in a simulation. Because you can't change people's languages overnight and cause division and strife, disunity, create, create whole new cultures and nations, unless you just alter the, the coding, because then, it, then it's very possible. And further evidence that this happened is the unfolding, not of linguistics that was coding, but in written writing, how it developed, because there is a natural progression. It did not start advanced. Proto-Ubaid Proto Sumerian did become Sumerian. Later, later, Ac the Akkadian borrowed from that. The Proto-Egyptian did develop into later Egyptian, then Hieratic and Demotic. And, and yes, we have a natural progression, especially the alphabet. The Phoenicians carried it, the Carthaginians carried it, the Greeks carried it, and, and the alphabet slowly became what it is today. It's a, it's a very fascinating study. But you're living in a simulation. An old thread weaves through the traditions of antiquity, a belief maintained by cultures thought to have never had contact. The people of our world were once together, at peace, unified, sharing one language. They were master builders and comprehended the secrets of the gods, so they built a gigantic monument with an objective to challenging the gods. These custodians saw the danger, understood that the that the contained were becoming uncontrolled, that this monument possessed a secret that when activated would collapse their power over humanity. So they retaliated. They introduced only slight modifications to our whole spirit coding and these tiny alterations resulted in major changes in human expression and our cerebral processing. Our frames of reference had been tampered with. The interference patterns so subtle resulted in a total breakdown in human communication. Unable to make sense of the scenario, humans allied themselves to those they could understand and quickly migrated away to build safe havens elsewhere, abandoning the very monument that would have freed them from this containment field. Only in a controlled holographic data field reality could the following ancient fragments be true. The tongues of men were diversified by various sounds, and the whole earth of humans was filled with fragmenting kingdoms, Sibylline oracles. In the ancient Mayan Popol Vuh document, the old American text reads that all men in the old times spoke the beloved speech. Akkadian, translated by George Smith over 120 years ago, reads, The building of this illustrious tower offended the gods. In the night they threw down what they had made. They scattered them abroad and made strange their speech. Hestios wrote that the survivors of a flood settled in Shinar, but were scattered abroad, later by a diversity of tongues. Ancient Greek writer. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. This is the book of the upright. 746. 
And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Genesis 11, 1. Egyptian historian Manatho over 2,000 years ago wrote that there had long ago existed a single universal language. Plato in Symposium wrote, Symposium wrote, There was a time, I say, when we were one, but now because of the wickedness of mankind, God hath dispersed us, and there is danger that we shall be split up again. The Babylonian historian Berossus wrote that, the gods introduced a diversity of tongues among men who until that time had all spoken the same language. The rabbinical Jubilees text claims that Abraham was the only one on earth at the time who retained the original tongue, for it had ceased from the mouths of the children of men. An ancient Sumerian text titled, In Merkar and the Lord of Arata, reads, Once upon a time, the whole universe, the people in unison, to Enlil in one tongue gave praise. Of course, this is my interpretation. In a simulated holography, the act of inducing a whole system of communication into a series of fractals, which allowed those within each reality tunnel to understand each other but not comprehend all the other groups, explains to me that A, the worldwide traditions across continents and oceans of this, sto uh, of this story are provable parallels and similarities between languages and scripts, syntaxes, grammar. Thousands of books have been published demonstrating these commonalities. All of this is evidence of a simulated holography. And B, that we are still watched. We are still supervised. There are custodians that still, they still watch over the affairs of humans. And it is my personal opinion that many conspiracy theorists and of course, I do fit into that category by many, by many others' opinion. But many conspiracy theorists are always labeling some of these elite faces, these personalities. They're always trying to find demons where, in actuality, it's demiurge. Many of the conspiracy theories are always pointing at the elite and pointing out what's going, what they're doing, and, and I'm no longer of that opinion. Yes, there are conspiracies among the elite. There are conspiracies in every single nation on this planet. There are conspiracies on the municipal level in every single township in every country in the world. However, some of these dark, nefarious conspiracies that are making their way across social media just might be programming protocols, distractions, might not have anything to do with real events or or real people we are not just being watched we are being corralled this is jason from archaics.com it's just more food for thought i hope i didn't offend you but if i did come back and watch more videos man and maybe uh you'll find an apology slipped in there somewhere artificial intelligence we hear about it all the time microsoft google Amazon. They all have these predictive systems of analysis, predictive analytics, machine learning. We hear all these terms and the public is left with the idea that we're creating software that is on par with the human intellect. Now, knowledge acquisition software, machine learning, this is all within the realm of possibility. We know because we're doing it. But artificial intelligence is a misnomer. AI is total bullshit. Don't buy into the marketing because that's all it is. Computer software systems are input in, input out. The software itself is merely of human invention and it's going to produce whatever a human designed it to do. A machine can never become actually intelligent as we have humans. All it can do is increase its processing power. This is entirely, this is, it, it's all marketing BS. Now, pattern recognition follows along the same line. Just input in, input in, input out. But when it comes to event prediction models, what you input changes everything as far as the output. If we obey a Newtonian physics world, then we have to input into our software the principles of Newtonian physics, the, con the physics constants that we have all learned in our co collegiate books. 
known variables that are well known in the scientific circles today. But the only AI system that truly exists is the one you're living in. The artificial intelligence of the holosphere that governs our everyday reality, you're immersed within it. We're not going to create an AI system within an AI system. It's not going to happen. But we can develop systems by which we can predict future events. It's already been done. The system is not perfect, but no systems are. But throughout my research, I have shown over and over and over that the entire history of the world demonstrates mathematical reality tunnels. That nations, when they're moving in a certain direction, create a mathematical trajectory. Individuals do the exact same thing. It is, it is my position that within this AI system, if we reanalyze the mathematics of our reality and we input those into an event prediction system, then yes, we can easily predict future events, but only in the particular only when we analyze two, three, or four events in history that are very similar in nature and we see the mathematical di dimensional distances that are between those similar events, we can easily plot the reality tunnel's trajectory and when to expect a similar event in the future. But the marketing BS that we're, that we're, we're pretty much bombarded with on a daily basis from the media and from the IT industry, it's total bullshit. There is no artificial intelligence. It's only an increase in processing power. And that, too, has a limit. Enjoy this presentation. I'm not asking you to believe any of it. But take it into consideration. Because years on down the line, you might remember you saw this video. Many years ago, I was reading Philo Judaicus. And it led me into the writings of Flavius Josephus. Both of these writers were approximately two millennia ago. Many historical references that were very curious to me led me into the writings of Marcus Varro. So from Marcus Varro, I continued to Herodotus. 440 BC, he wrote his The Histories. Many, many of the anachronisms that have been corrected in my Chronicon were pulled from Herodotus' writings, which I, I admire the man because his chief, his chief defense was, uh, I record what people say but I am by no means bound to believe it. So, following that principle, I began copying notes out of thousands of references. I spent over 20 years just pulling chronological material out of everything, and then I put it together in one timeline. The first draft was done in 1998. Second draft was done in 2003. The fourth draft is now published on archaics.com, and it's also within the files of the Facebook group, Archaics. It is absolutely free. But if you will notice in Chronicon, almost every single dated event has 9 to 14 chrono markers. The exact year it was in different calendars at different times. And the subject matter of the individual year-by-year annual records, I also refer to different mathematical parallels. I made over 10,000 mathematical discoveries in, in my research on the hi history of the world. Sumerian civilization unfolded much like, much like Canaanite Ugaritic and Rashemran. We find that the histories of Gnosis were very, very similar to Egypt. Many times I found the exact same numbers between historical events that were very similar in nature. It became so obvious that I had to create a chart. I have that chart now. And that chart is by which I, I study all history. That chart led to a series of protocols that end up de de I developed into an algorithm. In this video, I will show it to you. But I study history through a system of protocols that allows me to find truth from error, to see what events were manufactured and what events actually happened. Thousands of historical events follow reality tunnels, and they have predictive value. All the old occultists and mystics said the same thing over and over and over, from Henry Cornelius Agrippa all the way to the book Liber Chaos. 
And if any of you really want to get into some deep time space associated material, if you really want to delve deep into the architecture of this fantastic reality medium that we live in, then you find the book. It's in my library. It's called Liber Chaos. It's hauntingly accurate. But we live within an AI system. That's why no AI system will ever be developed inside this containment field. It's not. There are defense mechanisms within this holography that disallow for certain discoveries. Those people are edited out. But you can develop event prediction software. That's not even difficult. But you can't do it based on outdated, untrue, and absolutely BS Newtonian physics models. You just can't do it. In my studies of the history of the world, and I published Chronicon, not through Booktree, my normal publisher that's published most of my other nonfiction books, but just published it online, free to the public. Because I wanted to show that by studying 41 different ancient calendars and timekeeping systems and over 60 different cultures and, and all their dated historical chronological events and putting it all into one cohesive timeline that anybody can follow year by year over 5,500 years of human history all the way up to the year 2012, which is the last year I have, I have chronicled for Chronicon. And the reason being is because in 2011, my, my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, was published where I totally predicted that the Mayan long count was an error, the mathematics was wrong, scholars knew it, but the, but the media picked it up as a sensation. Hundreds of books were published about it, my, mine was totally ignored, still ignored today, but like I said before in other prior posts, it's okay, because it's there for anybody to see. The arithmetic is very clear. I show it in chart after chart after chart after chart. The Mayan long count could not have ended in 2012. It ends in November 2046. But well, that's another that's a subject for another video coming up soon. The event, predi event prediction software has already been developed, but most of it, it's like the Vegas Pick'em algorithm for gambling, 52.9% accurate at best. I mean, if you followed it and gambled all the time, then yeah, you probably make more money than you lost, but it's not really reliable. Then there are experts, ESPN publishes experts like Wickersham, and there's so many others, and they come and go, and most of the time they're wrong. So I have, I have run tests, and I have had friends and family involved, and they all tell me the same thing, shut up, sit down, they're going to kill you, all this stuff. You know, I'm not trying to hear any of that anymore. I don't care. I, I will tell the truth about this world that we are living in until the day I expire. Because when I go, I already know that it's only going to be an editing of the program that I'm following. And I will be scripted in somewhere else. 100% confident. Can't fear death. I don't ride, I don't ride a 2018 Harley 970 pound motorcycle with no, no helmet and no protection for nothing. I know when it's time to go, I'll go. As simple as that. But in, in event prediction systems, we have machine learning and date, date sequence prediction. We have, we have so many different innovative ways. And many of these ideas were genius and they worked for limited periods of time and then they stopped working. Any IT guru will tell you that all these innovative systems, they come up and these companies pay thousands and millions for them and then they quit working. And the reason is, is because most of it was in the mind, was in the mind, it was entirely subjective, and involved within the reality tunnel of the developer and not outside that. And this is, this is what Newtonian physics does. This Newtonian physics world where everything is so black and white and everything is perfectly measured and we know exactly that the, that the world spins at, at 1,000 miles per hour at an obliquity of 23.5 degrees hurling through space on a 7 million mile journey around the sun in a, in a loop that never closes at, at a Fibonacci spiral of 1.618. We know this 93 million miles away from a, a sun and it takes 365.25 days to get around the sun. This is Newtonian physics physics. It does not work. The arithmetic doesn't add up. It's total bullshit. But in my studies, I have found link after link after link after link, and they're all mathematic. Every single link forms a chain, and I put those together into an algorithm, and it's fantastic. And I can go forward, and I can go backwards in time, and I do all my studies in this fashion. But it shows me 100% that 
that we're not in a physical world. We're in a mathematical universe where the arithmetic of our existence is so incredibly precise and perfect that in a real physical world, having physical properties, these things couldn't exist. We couldn't be doing many of the things that we do today with skyscrapers and with phantom jets and with submarines and helicopters and gyroscopes, all these things that we do, fantastic technological innovations of the human race, would not be possible in a Newtonian physics world. There is an added dimension to reality that developers never take into consideration. This arithmetic governs everything that we do. If you have an accident in your life that you did not anticipate because you were subject to and governed by someone else's reality tunnels because you were pretty much living in stasis at the time and not really active in doing something, either constructive or destructive, you were just in stasis. And again, a similar event occurred three and a half months later or three and a half years later. We could take the distance in time between those two similar events and run it through a series of algorithms that would give us the one, two, or three dates in the future where that would happen again if you were living in stasis. Reality changes as soon as we make a decision. The arithmetic of your, that governs your life also changes. We can switch reality tunnels, but all too often, we switch right back into one that we were formerly in. It happens all the time. You decide to take a diet. You want to take a diet. You want to lose weight. You consciously set out to do those things. Life's going great. Then you have a setback. Then you dwell on it. Then you get depressed. Next thing you know, you're back, you're back existing within the same mathematical framework of existence you were prior to the diet. You, you switched right back to a prior, prior, prior reality tunnel. And now you're governed by all those dictates. And now all these strange coincidences happen in your life. Somebody, somebody from your past contacts you. You experienced deja vu. You've had a certain conversation before. You've witnessed something that you swear to God happened before. And what you really don't realize is that many of the particulars that you experienced in life prior to the switch of reality tunnels, they're in this reality tunnel. You will see them and revisit them again. You've returned back to from a place from whence you came. Therefore, you'll experience many of the things that were on that path. Reality is very interesting, but we are in a simulated biogram. This absolutely fantastic, intelligent apparatus that we are immersed within anticipates us. It directs us. It tries to teach us through experiences and through impressions. The only, the only defense we have against it is intuition. That we know something is wrong. That we know something isn't quite right. Something is different. These, this, this fantastic biosphere, this, this AI field that we are, we have found ourselves in is interactive, but it has no defense against the human that is moving in a direction that he wants to go and will take no for an answer. No, I mean, it will not take defeat. Many people who, who set out to accomplish something with fortitude, with force of will, sheer willpower alone, reality itself has a defense mechanism. It instantly creates that reality tunnel to isolate that individual away from others so that to con basically to contain the contagion, to contain this. So let's go ahead and give this guy what he wants because he's doing it. And maybe if we can separate him and give him all these extra things in his new reality tunnel, he won't go back and try to pull more fish out of the sea. In my researches, in Chronicon and studying the history of the world year by year and assimilating all the data decade by decade of what was going around in the world, the same numbers came up over and over and over and over and over. Their divisors, even, even, in, even in alternate dimensions, the numbers are the same. I could take the distance between two similar events in history if it didn't pull up one of these 24 numbers. All I had to do is multiply by 1.618 1. Or divide by 3.1416, and that number would be there. The reality tunnels operate in multiple dimensions. 
the reason pattern recognition systems are always failing is because the Newtonian physics models only, only allow for one, one answer to one computation. But the arithmetic that governs our reality is manifold. It, your answer to a problem in mathematics may be given to you absolutely perfectly, but it's given to you in a different dimension. And it's really easy because now we're into fractal geometry. Once you isolate, once you isolate the problem in mathematics, the answer becomes clear, even if it's given to you as a fractal. I know a lot of this is, is, is difficult to understand, but fractals are the exact same thing as a whole. They're just smaller. It's, they're just a different dimension of arithmetic, but there's the exact same numbers involved. History of the world is no different, measured in years, as the history of your life, measured in days and nights. The exact same arithmetic applies. The protocols of fractal geometry apply as well. And now I will give you some fundamentals about such a system and how it operates without giving too much away. Most pattern recognition systems are based upon a false premise. Seconds, minutes, hours, months. You cannot measure time accurately with this artificial construct. Humans design this. This has absolutely no relevance to the actual holography that we live within, which is measured by only two fundamental constants. The day, the turning of night, and day and the year which is currently 365.25 days to make a year these two govern everything in our life we have subdivided these periods of time into artificial segments to make it easier for us to plan calendars and plan out the events of our life but pattern recognition software and event prediction models that are based off this artificiality can only produce at best artificial results. They, they cannot be more specific. Days and years apply to movement, but we must also take into consideration space. The molecular cohesiveness and flow of water compared to the fluidity, fluidity of our time-space continuum share more in common than mere analogy. When two hydrogen molecules attach to an oxygen molecule, the two H molecules will always be arranged at an angle of 105 degrees from one another. What applies to space equally applies to space in motion, time. Making our water dominant planetary environment and H2O based anatomy to be fundamentally interactive in a holo field of 105 degree angles. Over the course of years studying world history with a calculator, I had noted hundreds of examples of events in the historical record that, relative to other events in the historical record, were all 138 years apart or its multiples. And I found this 138 year timeline to be absolutely fascinating. It also led to the discovery of my Phoenix research, which has been, which has been extensively published and I have several YouTube videos on. So many ancient records have events recorded in them from old texts from the 3rd and 2nd and 1st millennium BC that have events in spans of times that are commensurate with 138 and its multiples that I was able to construct this chart which is fascinating in and of itself because so many ancient libraries have been destroyed civilizations buried completely in mud the records absolutely lost the civilizations gone and yet we were still able to construct 22 of these events in in a perfect synchronicity of 138 year intervals many of you have followed my research and now know that these discoveries in the in the historical record led to the chronometrical discoveries of the interior arrangements of the Great Pyramid of Giza and how only the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt is the only pyramid in the world that has these measurements, internal chambers, ascendant chambers, and grand gallery, and uh, queen's chamber, king's chamber. No other pyramids in the world have these features. They only replicate the descending passages. Uh, over 450 pyramids around the world still standing have these descending passages that lead to a subterranean chamber below the monument. 
but only the Great Pyramid of Giza has the ascendant chambers. Only the Great Pyramid of Giza also records in hundred direct linear measurements the dimensions of 138 and all its multiples like 276, 414, 690, and so on. It says these discoveries have been published over and over in my books and in my posts and blogs and YouTube videos. But it's much deeper than just a historical template. The structure was built at least 4,700 years ago. Therefore, the arrangements in the interior provide a template to the future. When you study the Great Pyramid of Giza, the interior arrangements show the coding of the holosphere. The 365.25, the 23.5 degree obliquity, the ancient dynamic year, the stellar year of 360 days, lunar cycles, epicenters and uh, we have epicycles and cycles all throughout the Great Pyramid. You can even find the dimensions for the Vedic Kali Yuga calendar, the Sumerian King List, and the Mayan Long counts 13 bactons of 1,872,000 days recorded within the rectilinear uh, measurements of the Great Pyramid. We have within this structure basically a blueprint, a projector for this holospheric reality that we live in now, which has a terminus, which is also recorded inside the Great Pyramid, which also dates itself in its own construction at 2815 BC, after 90 years of construction, which was 1080 months. In the Old World calendar of the Annus Mundi calendar, this was 666 years before the Great Cataclysm, later known as the Biblical Flood, although it wasn't entirely a worldwide flood, it was devastating. This was... Uh, Really a tremendous discovery to find 138 in so many different measurements of the Great Pyramid. It bore out the historical record. Thousands of events in world history that are relative to to one another are de de they're pretty much separated by time periods of 138, 138 in its divisors, and 138 as found in other dimensions, which is easily easily to find by subtracting or multiplying by 1.618. Upon a closer scrutiny of the arrangements of the Great Pyramid, it was found to have a mirroring, a mirroring effect in its dimensions and in its measurements. And this is also corresponding to a, a, a basic, an aspect of our reality that is only now in theoretical physics being entertained. A sort of anti-arithmetic that belongs to the arithmetic that governs our dimension. In its most basic form, we can take a number and look at its holographic reflection and see the exact reverse of that number. But it's even more than that, because the reverse of that number would be found in a different dimension. And not a dimension as in another universe, but in another dimension of mathematics. It would still have the same properties, but you would not be able to identify it unless you had done the add addition, the subtraction, or the multiplication. A perfect event prediction pattern recognition system would not only identify the whole the whole reflective numbers the numbers that are in reverse that apply to our plane and the distances in between two relative events but would also be able to know when to apply that to a future construct to a future time when an event can actually be predicted based upon the predicates of the past Time is measured not by the calendar, but by the events that occupy it. In order, in order to create a perfect event prediction pattern recognition system, we cannot separate the operator of the system from the operation. There will be a interaction. It's almost like a cerebral interface holography, a, a an exchange of information between the mind that is doing the operation and the operation itself. This has to be taken into consideration when, when creating a pattern recognition or event prediction software. The old adage, history repeats itself, is absolutely accurate. However, following this old saying, many software engineers in the creation and development of pattern recognition systems have erred believing that that 
date sequence prediction would work just by simply finding an event in the past and measuring it against another event in the past to be able to predict a third event that would be similar in the future. This cannot be done because the dimensions change. A system, an operating system, must be able to identify when, when the nodal aperture will change dimensions. A reality tunnel is either being opened or closed when all of a sudden the exact same measurement in our reality right now suddenly changes by phi, by pi, some curvature equ equations, and the magic number of 5.08. Phi multiplied by pi is an, is an absolutely critical equation in any event prediction model. The entire history of the world can be measured in fractals of 5.08. This is a number that, as far as I am aware, is absolutely unknown to physics. There are two major methods in which we can predict a future event. They are fundamentally different. The first is to measure the distance between similar events in time and run your algorithms. Algor your algorithm, algorithmic system must take into consideration everything that I have presented in this video with a couple of other extra things I'm not going to mention right now. But the problem is, is it's absolutely impossible to take the distance between two relative events and run any system of algorithms and produce a third event that is factually going to happen like the first two events. It's not going to happen. Our reality doesn't work that way. Every time we make a measurement, an entirely new reality tunnel fractures off. That one has to take, be taken into consideration as well. It's in the arithmetic. It's there. It exists in potential. When we perform mathematical calculations with the intent to predict future events, we create what's called potentia instantly. Reality takes into consideration other possibilities that could happen based off the calculations. There are many other factors that come involved in this process. A good event prediction system will isolate those dates those dates are like a shotgun. It's like the first date is loading the bullet. The second and third dates that we're analyzing is actually shooting that bullet into a trajectory. The arithmetic measures that trajectory and instantly puts out a shotgun blast of three to seven different dates in the future that could all be the exact fulfillment of the two dates or three dates that were measured in the past as a control. This method I have found can be very accurate. As many of my friends and family know, what we did against the Vegas, the Vegas Pick'em algorithm in our NFL predictions. But there is another method that's even more accurate. But it, it, it necessitates a calendar of events that is already known. For example, if we know that a series of events will occur on a certain date, we can then run our algorithms on the, on the similar dates that happened in the past, and then we have eliminated a lot of potentia. Any future dates that we found that reality tunnels had opened in the arithmetic, we can go ahead and ignore those as merely potentia, not actualities. Nothing is going to happen on those other dates that's really relative because it's not scheduled to. All the humans are going to be at this event at this certain time, not on one of those other dates. Potentia is like that. Things are rescheduled at the last minute at all times. You'd be surprised how many times we can run algorithms on an event and find out that it's not going to occur when it was publicized to occur. What makes this such a very interesting scenario is that any time we can run algorithmic formulas to predict future events, we can also run them in reverse and we can find out some very interesting things about what was claimed to have occurred as opposed to what really occurred. And this is the danger of event prediction. When we study the arithmetic of the holosphere, we have to be careful which direction we're going because we're not always looking forward. And sometimes we just don't know it. Event prediction, pattern recognition systems are entirely viable. They can easily be put together. But the scientists and physicists of our time right now, 
happen to be the blindest idiots. Newtonian physics has completely blinded the world into something it is absolutely not. Take into consideration Elon Musk. The man said to be a genius. I don't know. I haven't seen that. I can't measure the rhythm of his ways because I don't know him personally. But I know this. The man has gone on record saying that we exist within a simulation. And yet, in the public arena, this same, same man is shooting rockets up into space. So which is it? Are we in a simulation? Or what are you doing with those rockets going into the atmosphere? I've told you in many of my other videos, the stars lie. If you believe that you're looking up into an actual window into the cosmos, you got another thing coming. In the year 1229 BC, the power of Ilium was broken when the city of Troy fell to the Mycenaean invasion to quakes and strange lightning blasts. This dating is confirmed. 476 years later, the descendants of Troy founded the city of Rome in 753 BC among the Latins and the Sabines. Rome would rise from monarchy to republic to empire and ultimately fall 1,229 years later in 476 and on many. But this is impossible synchronicity. But we can confirm these dates with, from historical references. What's also impossible is what I'm going to show you in this presentation. These dates can't be real, but they are. They're verified. Welcome, my friends, to the Simulacrum. Guys, I have never before published this data. And it is astonishing. It was published last night for the first time in textual form in archaics. But you and I are living in a controlled biogram, a simulation. In this presentation is proof. Many of you are not going to like what you hear. And for the others, there will grow a spark within you that will burn with an excited intensity when you begin to realize the ramifications that this data has for you and for all of us in the collective. To detect the cracks in the holosphere, one must view the whole of world history. To isolate particulars and build historical narratives is all that has thus far been done. The publishing of a disjointed series of facts only compartmentalizes segments of history as if part is not synthetic to its whole. This is all that's ever been done. We cannot possibly recount here all the chronological points made and references given in my published books, in my articles, all my charts, my 170 plus videos. Chronicon and all these sources have been given to you in the files of Archaics and the posts and in these YouTube videos. For purposes of this study though, here is a small reminder of what you need to know. In 4039 BC was the first appearance of the moon. It was the capture flood, marking a milestone in the 600 year Anuna Nur chronology. Now, 3895 B.C. was the Phoenix Destroyer. It initiated a catastrophic reset so complete that later records claimed it was a new heavens and new earth. But it was a pole shift. This began a 6,000-year countdown to the next time there's a pole shift causing a new heavens and a new earth in 2106 A.D. Now, in 2909 B.C., before the flood, is the first year of the 670 years of the Sumerian king list, or the 241-200 turnings that started the Anuna dynasty. Now, 2239 B.C., the Phoenix revisited 1656 years after the first time, and it totally caused the Great Flood. And in 1899 B.C., this was the 340th year after the Great Flood, a disaster recalled as the Babel dispersion when humanity was attacked because they had threatened the gods. 1229 B.C. was the tenth and final year of the Trojan War, when Ilium lost to Mycenae. Here are three facts that need to be remembered when I retell this story. Fact. Phoenix periodicity is every 138 years. 138 times 3 is 414. Stephen Jones in his book The Secrets of Time published a book-length study allowing so many historical events in history showing that they were all 414 years apart. He claims 414 years is a cursed Earth period and Mr. Jones knows nothing about the Phoenix research. Fact. In my own book, When the Sun Darkens, I demonstrate in two full chapters many famous historical events and how they were all 414 years apart. These were ones that were unknown to Jones. Fact. What we call physics constants are actually coding protocols that allow the simulacrum to operate in multiple dimensions simultaneously while convincing us that a linear progression is always what we experience. For example, that events are sequential. 
but it's an illusion of causality, meaning historical events are non-local phenomena imported on into our collective conscious. But I have to say this another way. None of these events ever occurred, and the evidence that they are contrived is found in their mathematical symmetry and by scrutinizing them under the lens of physics constants. Keep up with me. I'm going to show you now. So let's take a much closer look at these dates that I cited. In 4039 BC, the capture flood occurred, the appearance of the moon. This was 6145 years before the year 6000 Annus Mundi, or 2106 AD, 6000 years since the Phoenix reset pole shift of 3895 BC that caused the new heavens and new earth from lithospheric displacement. The 6145 years is 1229 times 5 years from the arrival of the Igigi, enemies of the Anuna who control our societies from deep earth biospheres. The Igigi are the observers, watchers, enemies of the subterrestrial Anuna. The conflict will endure 6,145 years, or 5 times 1229. This is interesting. 4039 BC, capture flood, Luna appears. 1,229 years later is 2810 BC, when the Great Pyramid is 5 years old and it is sealed. Then passes another 1229 years to the year 1581 BC. Then 1229 years to the year 352 BC. We don't know what happened on those dates. Then another 1229 years to the year 877 BC, and then the final 1229 years to the final and 6,000th year, 2106 AD. The Igigi are destroyed by the chief cornerstone. Now, the stone the builders rejected will in 2106 AD become the head of the corner. He will take the authority, excuse me, from the high ones that are on high, or the Igigi. Our date here of 2106 AD as the end is the is only the end of the world as we know it. If we take these 6,145 years and analyze them by phi, another dimension, or 1.618, the golden mean, represented numerically by the Fibonacci series, this 6,145 divided by phi becomes 3797 years. Any takers here? Nostradamus specifically wrote that the final year of his prophecies was the year 3797 AD. Anybody can Google this. In a whole field of graduated degrees of phi, we find that 6145 years and 3797 uh, years are the exact same time period. But this only gets more profound. Where did we see 1229 before? In the 10th year of the Trojan War, 1229 BC, unusual blasts of electricity from the sky melted whole cities. Anatolia, the Hittite culture collapsed. Across the United Kingdom, vitrified ruins have been found in these regions supporting the historical accounts. Electricity from the sky. This strange series of attacks from the sky was 670 years after a similar assault against humanity. In 1899 BC, the Babel event was a single government and culture fractured into 70 nations speaking 70 different languages in an instant. The story claiming that the gods admitted that, that what, what had to be done because mankind was becoming capable of anything. The traditions describe a lightning bolt from heaven de destroying the Tower of Babel and storms drove all the people apart. 670 years. Where did we see that already? In 2909 BC, the seven kings of the Anuna ruled in a series of five dynasties for 670 years to the Phoenix Cataclysm of 2239 BC or the Great Flood. The year 1656 Annus Mundi, or 414 times 4. So 670 years bears a closer scrutiny, and we are not disappointed. For 670 divided by 5, which is 1.618, is 414.0. It's a cursed earth period. As if, this, as if this was just not enough, Nostradamus again blows our mind. Because in 1994, members of the Italian National Library in Rome discovered buried in their archives a formerly unknown and unpublished manuscript, fully illustrated with paintings and texts personally done by the prophet Nostradamus. After studying this work, the Roman researcher and Nostradamus expert Ottavio Cesare Romati published in his book, Nostradamus, the Lost Manuscript, the following passage written by Michel de Nostradamus. Many will die before the phoenix dies, until 670 his dwelling shall endure. His dwelling shall endure. This dwelling is the simulacrum. It will endure until it collapses. 
Nostradamus was a child in 1508. He was alive, which was 670 years before the year 2178 AD, this being 138 years after the 2040 cataclysm caused by Phoenix, the sixth seal, the return of the vapor canopy, and 2178 AD is the collapse of the simulacrum, when the captives are set free. For those of you who have watched my short video, The Archaic's Paradox, you know the significance of 2178 in our holography. Our world is not what you think. Perhaps I should have been slower in this video, but we're going to have a moment of silence, and you can look over the charts that I'm now going to show you, because these charts show that what we've discovered in history is verifiable, but it can't be real. I would like to be able to tell you that what you're looking at is just ordinary historical events that happen randomly, which is exactly what you would expect if historical events were, were happening randomly. But that's not what's happening. It is not what we're seeing here. It boggles the mind that the Seven Kings began in 2909 BC and 670 years later of the Sumerian King List, the Great Flood wipes out that entire pre-flood civilization. Again, Humanity comes together after 340 years of the flood in 1899. They build a monument. Now, I've, I've so showed you in other videos that that wasn't an actual tower. It was a pyramid. Humanity knew the secret of the pyramid, and they were trying to replicate it. The gods were offended. The Igigi, who observed from their lunar stations and holography, which is hidden by a hologram called the moon, and they watched this, and they scattered humanity. 670 years after that Babel scattering, scattering look at this chart was the fall of Troy, one of the most famous stories from the ancient world, 1229 BC. And yet, this entire historical holography from the arrival of the Igigi and the, and the first appearance of our moon in 4039 BC is 1229 times 5, all the way to the year 6000, the 6,000th year since the last time it was a new heavens and new earth. The synchronicity is, is prof it's, just, it's just amazing. Then Nostradamus mentions that Phoenix will endure 670 years, but it was a code for the year for 414, the Phoenix chrono chronology. And then 670 is divided perfectly by 5, 1.618, to produce 414.0, 414. Multiple dimensions. This isn't real. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. I'm sorry if it gets a little meticulous. Uh, the arithmetic, I mean, it, it, it's, it's what I do. Study history through the lens of physics. Now, uh, for those of you who that really appreciate my channel, I'm probably going to release another video here in a minute about, about, about that. But I found something that I want really bad and I can't afford it. But you can make that happen You with your donations. Uh, I will never monetize my channel. I'm not going to prostitute it and, and try to add all these commercials and disrupt my content. But if you're willing to help, you can. If not, if not, I understand. Some people are just not able. Now, I'm trying to buy a YouTube studio, a full, a full building. I'm, I'm about to do the whole works. I'm probably going to release a video about that. But, uh, anyway, uh, this is Jason of Arcades.com. We live in a simulacrum, my, my friends. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but don't believe a thing about history because it was entirely contrived. In order to put forth a theory that we are existing within a simulated holography, a matrix, then we need to also put forth models that help explain its construction, its protocols. We've done this in several videos already. We've given pieces of the whole. This video only concerns another one of those pieces. Palindromes in our DNA. Palindromes in the space-time structuring of our reality. Palindromes that form these amazing patterns in events that are similar in nature. When a first event occurs, that is 83 days after a second event, and then 83 days after a third, and the third event has adopted facts that belong to both the first and the second event. This is very intriguing. This is an unusual video, but it's only one of the 19 different fundamentals that we have found in the simulated context that we exist within. We exist within a, a infinitude of palindromes that are happening every single second we exist. Jason from Archaics.com, this is a very interesting video, as I said. Enjoy it, chew it all up, and spit out the bones. 
you may not be living in a simulation, but I know that I am. In 1973, the World Trade Center towers were completed in New York City. At that time, standing 110 stories each, these were the tallest buildings in the world. On February 21st of the same year, an Israeli jet shot down a Libyan passenger airliner, killing 103 people. These two events would appear to be unconnected, occurring in opposite hemispheres, to be separated in both time and space. But were they? The destruction of the World Trade Center towers in 2001, popularly remembered as 9-11, is a day not easily erased from the minds of Americans. It is the one day in our collective past that we all recall perfectly what it was we were doing on that very day. In the complex geometrical matrix of our lives, we know precisely the time and the location of our experiences as 9-11 unfolded. But was this a predictable event? Is there a correlation between the World Trade Center destruction and the destruction of a Libyan passenger jet 28 years earlier? Is there a definite method by which anyone could predict a future event? Could it be possible that the future of anything is hewn from its history? The answer to all of these questions is yes. The information detailed in this video will alter your perception of reality for once the human mind is stretched by a new idea it can never go back to its original dimensions. In order to fully comprehend how easy it is for one to perceive the future we must first understand the findings of some of the greatest minds who have ever pondered this topic. Albert Einstein believed that time itself was a geometrical concept. The world famous physicist said that the future is every whit as necessary and determined as the past. And that people like us who believe in physics know that the distinctions between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Einstein's opinion was not dissimilar from other great scientific minds. The Russian physicist P. D. Alspensky in the early 20th century in his epic work Tertium Organum wrote, future events are wholly contained in preceding ones, and if one could know the force and direction of all events which have happened up to the present, for example, if we knew all the past, by this we could know all the future. He too believed that time was a geometrical construction embedded within the human psyche. He further wrote, the past and future are existing simultaneously on the lines perpendicular to our plane, and the past is identical with the future because phenomena come from both sides and they go in both directions. This is a palindrome. If this is true, then this concept must be demonstrated. If demonstration can be replicated many times, then a fundamental aspect of our existence has been discovered. If the phenomena of an event is moving in two directions in time and space at the same time, then we can perceive our space-time structures acting similar to the ripples on the surface of a pool of water. An event happening right now in the present would correspond to the epicenter of a concentric pattern of wave rings rippling up the surface of a pool after a drop of water fell upon the smooth surface. The ripples traveling to the left would symbolize past events, while those moving toward the right were future occurrences. No matter how far the ripples travel, they will always be equidistant from the epicenter of the ring formation. Each wave ring is the same distance from the center as the corresponding wave ring on the other side of the pool. If this thesis is to be demonstrated and explained, then we need to apply fixed terms to the particulars of this phenomenon. For our purposes here, the drop, an event that creates the space-time structure, the wave rings that issue out in both directions, the past and future, is the center of the entire pattern. Thus, this is an isometric epicenter. This word, isometric, denotes something that goes in two directions at the same time. And in this case, we are referring to timelines, wave rings. The epicenter is any event in history that one would want to know the future of. The future of an event is represented by the wave rings that travel to the right, but as these are merely the geometrical reflections of the same events that traveled to the left, the past, then to understand the future events, we must compare them with those that are equidistant from the isometric epicenter. For example, 
The third wave ring to the right, future, is a reflection of the third wave ring to the left, the past. Around the perimeter of the rings, all the way around the pool, the rings are one and the same. Only from the epicenter are they of any distance from one another. This is an isometric projection, the comparative analysis of an observer, a historian or prophet, of two events, one in the past and one in the future, both connected to a central event geometrically. This is calendrical isometrics. No further terms will be introduced in the exposition of this thesis. We take for our isometric epicenter the year 1973 when the World Trade Center was completed in New York City as the tallest buildings in the world in that year. The year Israeli shot down a passenger jet. In retrospect, we see easily that 9-11 was 28 years after 1973, passenger, passenger jets destroying the World Trade Center towers in 2001, skyscrapers where, wherein worked many thousands of people, a rather high concentration of them being Jewish and Israeli. Studying the end of the World Trade Center, we are reminded of their beginning. In 1973, the isometric epicentral year, when looking backward to the geometrical space-time reflection of 2001 from 1973, we are taken back that same 28 years to the year 1945, and to a most remarkable and little-remembered event in American history that was never mentioned by the media when the events of 9-11 were unfolding in 2001. In 1945, a U.S. B-25 bomber piloted by Lieutenant Colonel William Smith crashed right through the 78th and 79th floors of the tallest building in the world, the Empire State Building in New York City, New York. The pilot was flying through low fog clouds and lost his bearings. The space-time reflection is hauntingly precise. It was United Airlines Flight 175 that slammed into the South Tower's 79th and 80th floors, a wing even striking the 78th floor, according to David Icke in his phenomenal work, Alice in Wonderland and the World Trade Center Disaster. Had an observer taken into consideration the 1945 bomber accident involving the tallest building on Earth in, in the city of New York when New York erected taller buildings, the World... World Trade Center in 1973, which are the tallest structures in that year, a taller building was erected in 1974 the following year. He would have been able to predict that a plane or planes would strike the World Trade Center in 2001. Another example can be made of the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand that catapulted Europe into World War I. This assassination was carried out exactly 49 years after another high-level assassination in 1865, that of Abraham Lincoln. A researcher seeing the parallels between Lincoln and Ferdinand would quickly see that the two shared things in common. They both opposed the banking cartel of the Rothschilds and were enemies of the internationalist cryptocracy that now runs the entire world. The truth of both of their assassinations has been officially declared, but the truth is that they were carried out by the agents of the world banks. The researcher would then count 49 years into the future from the second assassination and find a third murder, this being the November assassin of President John F. Kennedy. Whole books, documentaries, and articles have been written showing the uncanny parallels between Lincoln and Kennedy, but what is largely unknown is that Kennedy was about to issue an executive order that would critically damage Rothschild control over American banks. Every event of every second in space and time is geometrically connected isometrically to both past and future times and events. By analogy, our space-time structure is like the same pool of water, but instead of a single drop disturbing the smooth surface in a pattern of ever-growing rings, every fraction of our own existence is permeated with wave ripples from countless events from in numerous times that create interference patterns that slightly alter the future wave rings, the events, so that they never quite mirror exactly their past counterparts. This is why there are slight deviations in that no future event can totally replicate a similar event in the past. But the phenomenon is real, it is demonstrable, and the concept was understood by the ancients. To continue with our analogy, the fabric of reality is this pool of water, as it would appear as thousands of raindrops slammed into its already rippling surface, forming patterns within patterns. The ripples, events, do not hinder one another as they transect. They flow through one another. The space-time interface of multitudes of timelines all operating simultaneously is the cause for the effect we erroneously call coincidence. 
Our predecessors believed that the knowledge of the future was accessible by the study of the past. A golden inscription discovered in the famous tomb of King Tutankhamun of Egypt reads, I have seen the past. I know the future. King Esarhaddon of Assyria in the 7th century BC left behind a tablet inscription in stone reading, The future shall be like the past. King Jedediah, better known as Solomon, author of Ecclesiastes, wrote, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Because the phenomenon of the passage of events through the space-time structure has the quality of being isometric, traveling both into the past and future at the same time, scholars five centuries ago, like Firmicus Maternus, were able to understand that the beginning of anything was to be found out by the unfolding of historical events. More contemporary philosophers and historians have not deviated from this tenet. In his discourses, Niccolo Machiavelli made two statements that capture our attention. He said, if one examines with diligence the past, it is easy to foresee the future. Then he goes on to remark, he who would foresee what has to be should reflect on what has been, for everything that happens in the world at any time has a genuine resemblance to what happened in ancient times. There are few men alive who can boast of having researched more of our world's ancient beliefs and histories than Gerald Massey, author of huge volumes titled Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, and The Natural Genesis. These immense tomes are packed with historical, anthropological, and mythological data. Massey's lectures book from the 1880s contains these statements he made. The past is a region to explore. It is impossible to understand the present without the pro most profoundest knowledge of the past. And our past deeds must and will make our future fate. A contemporary of Massey was the occultist Franz Hartmann, who in 1888 published a work on magic. Hartman perceived that the entire universe is made up of matter that vibrates at different frequencies, which gives different physical ma materials the densities that they have. This is now a known fact about all physical objects, the illusory world that still mystifies even the quantum physicist. The number of vibrations at a, at a given interval is what identifies something from something else. What interests us here is that Hartman wrote, if everything has a certain number of vibrations and these vibrations increase or diminish at a certain ratio and in regular periods, a knowledge of these numbers will enable us to predict a future event. Calendrical isometrics is the science of the future. Instead of counting vibrations, the historian or prophet counts days or years as his numbers, which are represented by the wave rings upon the surface of the pool of water. A very relevant statement was uttered in 1902 by Judge Thomas Trohard when he wrote, The more deeply we investigate the world we live in, the more clear it must become to us that all of our science is the translation into words or numerical symbols of that order which already exists. Oswald Spengler agreed, writing in The Decline of the West, The most valuable thing in the classical mathematics is its proposition that number is the essence of all things perceptible to the senses. Numbers serve as the alphabet in the system of analyzing history in the future, but it is the forward and backward isometric timelines that construct sentences out of these numerical letters we employ and multiple isometric projections all linked to the same year form for us entire paragraphs, pages, and even a whole book of knowledge about a future event. Our present blindness to this phenomenon is partly because we have been duped by historians and chronologists over and again into accepting that any particular calendar is of any importance, that the artificial structures of mechanical time govern our existence. Nothing could be further from the truth. The historian Lewis Mumford summed it up perfectly in his monumental work titled Technics and Civilization when he wrote, time is measured not by the calendar, but by the events that occupy it. That 1973 was our epicentral year in our study of the World Trade Center does not in any way restrict 1973 from being a part of any other isometric projection. Many events occurred in 1973, and for every single individual event, there are isometric projections connecting those events with both past and future events and times. This forward and backward pulse of the space-time continuum forms our everyday reality. At 20 miles per second, our world supposedly moves around the sun immersed in an incomprehensible vast space-time structure virtually saturated with unseen events in motion. 
current events are the space-time reflections of future phenomena not yet passed through. In the year 1054, the entire world witnessed a stunning supernova in the Crab Nebula. Many Europeans and others named their children after the bright star explosion. Also in 1054, Pope Leo IX excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, which resulted in the great rift between the Eastern and Western Christian Church. This division was a loss of power for Italy, headed by the Papacy. Christianity emerged out of the roots of Judaism and Greek belief. Constantinople headed the Greek Church. And the two elements that stand out in 1054 are religious division and the appearance of a bright star. At this time in Europe, the Jews were spread, spread throughout the nations because the Romans had completely obliterated their nation and Jerusalem in the year 135. All of the European powers at that time distrusted the Jewish people because of their conspiracies and the Muslim invasions of southern Europe when Jews opened the gates of several cities to allow the Moors and Saracens to evade the Christian cities. Christian peoples of Europe were offended because it was they who had taken the Jewish exiles in after their flight from Rome. If we compare 135 Common Era to the year 1054 Common Era, we find that they are 919 years apart. In 1054, the Roman power was weakened from a religious political conflict, but in 135 CE, the Romans were empowered and crushed the Jewish nation in the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, which in Hebrew means the son of a star. Now, when we search isometrically beyond 1054, in the future, the same 919 years, we arrive to 1973 when Israel was attacked by an alliance of Islamic nations in the Yom Kippur War. This religious political war found Israel surrounded but totally victorious as they saved Jerusalem. The circumstance is the same but only the outcome differing. That every future is an echo of its past is demonstrated by this pe peculiar forward and backward trait embedded within the geometrical framework of history. Could it be possible that some men are influenced by a future that exists in space but has not yet transpired in time? Every second we spend in the present we are held together by an infinite amount of past as well as futures. We are sentient beings literally trapped at the intersect between two infinities. If the future did not yet exist somewhere, we could not exist either. The space-time sequence of events is more to something, be it a property of our collective psyche or an eternal mind, if there is a difference. Somewhere, the future exists in space, though unrealized in time. This was a belief 15 centuries ago by Augustine of Hippo. He wrote, where did those who sang prophecy see these events if they do not yet exist? To see what has no existence is impossible, and those who narrate past history would surely not be telling the truth if they did not discern events by their soul's insight. If the past were non-existent, it could not be discerned at all. Therefore, I conclude both future and path, past exists. And because it exists, interwoven into the matrix of, pa of present and past, it is accessible. Our minds are open to every impression that touches us as we flow through our environments. We traverse our lives through a medium of innumerable contacts, immersed in an unfathomable multitude of places that remain non-local because physically we can only experience one time at a time. For this reason, we are sometimes overcome with the sensation that we already know something that we also understand we have never come into contact with, that we have seen or experienced something before which we have no memory of. Or the feeling that we are being watched overtakes us and we have performed some certain acts exactly in the same way before, but it was in the unremembered past. The sensations of deja vu, occurrences of retrocognition, synchronicity, and coincidence are reminders that the world around us that we perceive through the agency of our limited senses is far greater than we are able to grasp. Because the past can be attained by the agency of memory, then this necessarily implies that the future can also be experienced through imagination. Poetically, with the past as memory and the future perceived through imagination, then our present reality is the ever-fleeting passage of what's imagined into what's remembered. That prophets have foretold many recorded events long prior to their unfolding in the human drama is well attested in the literature of nations around the world spanning back millennia. What is not known is how they do it. We are given the answer that these men were touched by the divine, and this could be so. We are created beings, the question being only the identity of our makers. Encoded within the structure of our own biological programs are precise geometrical informations. 
there appears to be a direct connection between our external space-time structural existence and material reality and our internal geometrical DNA makeup. The forward and backward property expounded upon in this work concerning historical timelines is scientifically referred to as a palindrome. This is a sequence of numbers that count both forward and backward from an epicentral point. Intriguingly, it has been discovered that much of our DNA is structured in the form of these palindromes. As yet, undeciphered sentences that read forward and backward mystifying the geneticists. In fact, perhaps as much as 95% of our DNA remains undeciphered according to Sol Luckman in Conscious Healing. If this is the foundation of our body in the microscopic realm in which our psyche seems to be moored, then naturally this is also a property of the universe that we are suspended within. The macrocosm merely reflects the microcosm. Isometric projections are real and measurable in the outer world of experiences because they reflect the inner world of man. The famous critical thinker René Descartes wrote, It were far better to never think of investigating truth at all than to do so without a method. Our method is to study what occurred during certain years, then to examine the past for events that were very similar in nature. The distance in time between these two events allows us to perceive when a similar event will occur in the future. When isometric patterns are detected, we are afforded a window into the past to events preceding that molded the conditions in time and space to events that follow. In the collective, the holosphere we exist currently in, there is a fixed geometry of events that we all experience together, a construct having us move in a certain direction. Many of these major events are arranged in historical time as palindromes, but this is better interpreted as coding. Some of our histories are not actual happenings, but coded memories injected into this holographic medium. This is the topic we will return to. Through the study of calendrical isometrics, we see clearly who we are and where we came from. Two requirements necessary when considering where we are going. It is time for scholarship to take on probably the most penetrating of all arcane mysteries and answer for us today this question, why are the oldest writings in the world so similar? A simple question, but this is no light statement. It has for too long been ignored that the same symbol, same plot line, same pantheon, same histories are all found in the earliest texts. Their disparity is a natural consequence of the fragmentation of civilization in the midst of the distant past. But we are, we are led to conclude that this is coincidence. But perhaps the truth is a little bit stranger. The evidence that there existed long ago a single parent culture, a parent theology, a universal language, and a universal syllabus derived from information contained in a vast archive of universally accepted records is now being proven over and over. In vain do establishment experts and, and scholars attempt to explain this anomaly by claiming that the correspondences between different cultures and writings was due to borrowing. But this shallow attempt circumvents the evidence. There are stunning parallels between the oldest writings that simply cannot be attributed to borrowing, especially because some of these cultures were so far isolated from one another that borrowing was highly unlikely. Aside from localized racial and cultural materials introduced at later dates, the earliest traditions and texts basically tell the same story. This is consistent not only with the histories, but even their prophecies align, their beliefs about a specific future. The hermetical literature, Gnostic and Kabbalistic traditions mirror older beliefs and writings and in themselves offer little new more than ancient writings did not already convey. The apocryphal and the pseudepigraphical works, largely born from the Alexandrian texts modified by Jewish scribes, contain elements derived from the oldest known human records. The Quran of Arabia, too, contains elements that are not Arabian. The Greek writers like Plato, Aristotle, Thucydides, naturalists like Anaximander, Lucretius, Pliny, and others, they introduce scientific and philosophical ideals in Grecian, Alexandrian, and Mediterranean culture and learning, but these were just mere reflections of earlier discoveries and concepts. 
The amazing scientific clarity of Ovid's metamorphosis writings on the creation is but a reiteration of the cosmologies of even older Akkad, Babylon, Sumer, texts like the Atrahasis epic, the Babylonian Enema Elish record, the epic of Gilgamesh, Hesiod's Theogony, the Mayan Popol Vuh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Pyramid text, and the Old Coffin text, the Gnostic Pistis Sophia, and the Genesis record. The Scandinavian Elder Edda, German Volsunga Saga, the Book of the Four Masters, and the Irish Book of Invasions, the Frisian Orlind Manuscript, and even elements of the Beowulf Epic contain fragments of renditions of the archaic Sanskrit Vedic scriptures of the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Puranic writings of ancient India. There are even parallels between the Gnostic Nag Hammadi text and the Dead Sea Scroll Library that span back millennia before these were even penned. The Celtic traditions and fragments that have survived are stunningly similar to the famous Odyssey and the Iliad of Homer and Virgil's Aeneid. The Revelation book in our Bibles was spread out throughout the entire world. The Apocalypse was a belief powerfully impressed upon the ancients. The Viking Ragnarok prophecies tell the Revelation and Sibylline oracles from the perspective of a mariner and essentially mirror the apocalyptic imagery of the first cataclysm involving a gigantic people in the end of the draconian system when the pole shift changed the world's stellar calendars into lunar reckoning systems. Even the Aztecs were familiar with the Revelation record, inherited from the bearded Toltecs before them. At the city of Tenochtitlan was excavated the famous Stone of the Fifth Sun. It's, it's often called the Calendar Stone, but that's an error. This 24-ton relic displays catastrophic episodes that ended world ages up to the present age. Just as the Revelation imagery has Christ returning at the end of the world age with a sword protruding from his mouth, so too does the Toltec imagery show a God appearing at the end of the fifth sun with a blade sticking out of his mouth. The power of speech to make war. In 5,000 years of recorded human history, the historical record is rife with buried, lost, flooded, and burned libraries. With over 99.9% you know, .9 of the world's writings having been edited out from discovery, it is unusual indeed that those that are left behind all t have the same details. As one who has studied every writing aforementioned and many more besides, at the risk of perpetuating an offensive idea, a situation that will cause many to dismiss it outright for a variety of reasons, I, Jason of Archaics.com, assert the following. A whole of anything when siphoned through a holographic sieve would create versions of the original while maintaining variant traits between the versions that would keep them different enough from each other to preserve the idea of individuality while also containing within each version denominators that link them to their parent predivided original. Bear with me now. Also, the languages, dialects, and scripts of the world are evidence of this, this separation. The traditions, cosmologies, and texts of antiquity are also evidence of this. The different varieties of the human species we identify as races are also evidence of this. It's as if something took original prototypes and ran them through a, a kaleidoscope it seethed that, that brought out all these varieties, and yet all these varieties maintain fractals of the whole in their writings, in their memories, in their traditions, in their prophecies, in their genetic makeups. In our dark realities and other videos, we have attempted to warn you that our world is not what you think. Not one person alive today was living in the month of May in the year 1902. There is more evidence that our habitat is simulated, too perfect, monitored, and changed daily to accommodate life. Our histories are simulated. There is no way you can disprove that everything prior to May 1902 wasn't simulated ex nihilo out of nothing, and that our present simulated holography began in 1902 and will run 19.8 more years to the year of May 2040. I know this sounds bizarre, but you can't disprove it. And if you were to follow all the evidence, it's, it's harrowing. While these ideas are hard to process, remember, if any one aspect of our existence is shown to be simulated, then everything is simulated. 
This is Jason with Archaics.com. Just a little food for thought. We're going down a rabbit hole, my friends. We're at the edge, but we're about to go deeper. The resurrection of the dead. The ability, the belief that this life is not all there is. The promise that we have received through religionists that we can come back or that we move on to a better place. Resurrection has such an entirely powerful hold over the human psyche. It has empowered religions to do whatever they wanted to do. But is it a fallacy? Could resurrection actually happen? Are we, if we look at this from an entirely different perspective, I think you might agree with me that resurrection isn't just theoretical, it's not just a promise. But if we reanalyze the nature of reality, resurrection is absolutely plausible. This is Archaics.com, very short video, straight to the point. Hope you enjoy the presentation. Remember, our world is not what it seems. Resurrection as a plausible possibility relies entirely on the true nature of material reality. A physical, organic, mechanical cosmos would absolutely require continued existence of DNA material to make resurrection possible. But this involves the bringing back of a body and not the soul. In a holospheric cosmos, resurrection is simple. It's a system reboot of all pervasive holographic data that was never lost. The greatest evidence of holospheric reality in antiquity is the global traditions Near Eastern tablet records and the Old Testament account of the instant confusion of languages. Mere slight alterations in human pattern recognition cognitive abilities would produce major differences of expression while also maintaining many language universals and synchronicities. The oldest written languages in the world all exhibit evidence of a common origin because they are holographic fractals all stemming from a now unknown parent tongue. The, introdu the introduction of a new subroutine into the holospheric matrix would alter the ways we perceive reality and express ourselves. In rebooting a system back to its original state in a hologram would be a very simple matter. Making the division of tongues and even resurrection not unusual nor miraculous, but highly probable. The only aspect of our existence that is truly real are our spirits. All else is programming. The architecture of our personality mandates that there is something more than just biological coding, DNA, RNA, and all, all the strictures of the, the biological community's textbooks and everything that they have made us believe that we are merely the result of a chain of chemical compounds and reaction chemical reactions. This is absolutely untrue. The physical world has physical laws that make these things be like phi, pi, curvature equations. Uh, oh, we're, all, we're all very familiar with the physics constants, but they govern the physical world. Our personalities far transcend anything that Newtonian or even quantum physics can explain. Not even the mysteries of non-locality can adequate, adequately provide an explanation for the wide disparity and differences of human personalities. These personalities come from the fabric of something else that is not moored to the physical reality. So resurrection, the division of tongues at the Tower of Babel, and many other ancient anomalies that we find in the historical record would all make sense in a holographic reality. I know that every every inner cord of your inner being rebels against the idea of simulation theory. But simulation theory is the only cohesive explanation that solves every single mystery of the cosmos.